Another thing you've said, uh, to shift gears a little bit, uh, that got a tremendous reaction, uh, 20 things we learned about humanity mm. from, from COVID, our experiences mm-hmm. in COVID. Yeah. Tell us about what we learned from COVID, about ourselves. Wow. Yeah. So I wrote this thread in, I think it was July 2021, where I was just reflecting on some of the things I've noticed or had confirmed about human behavior during the, honestly, global experiment. Yeah of the uh, so-called pandemic. Um, I think it was a huge psychological opportunity. It was like a study. It was really an ability to understand how human beings deal with fear and peer pressure and groupthink and authority and authoritarianism versus liberty. And so on. I, I was, man, I felt like in the past two and a half years, I, I, I learned as much as I, I did in the previous 20, just when it comes to human interactions and psychology. So I, I wrote this thread. It was, yeah, the 20, 20 different points of just short observations of things that I noticed, not just in my, in my home country, but seeing things that were happening all around the world. I think the very first one I think the number one, the first in the thread, I think, was most people would rather be in the majority than be right. I yeah. think that was the first one. Most people would rather be in the majority than be right. And that was going to just be a single tweet. And then I thought, wait, no, I've got more. I've got more. And I came up with 19 more. Um, I would, would you like me to, to, go, to go into any of them in particular? Well, the one I'd like to tease out is okay. the way in which we, strangely, despite the lessons of history, seem to prefer security mm. to freedom. Yes. That we'll flee to have somebody tell us what to do, save us, save us, save us, mm. rather than cling to our freedoms, which are so hard won and so easily lost. Yes. Because you lose those freedoms. Yes. You may not get them back. Yeah, well, I, okay, I, I, I have sort of two answers to this one. I think the first one is recognizing that in a relatively free country or state or, or just anywhere, I think that the one thing that a reasonable, rational thinking person will trade for liberty and freedom is safety slash security, right? I think that we like to, certainly in the West, we like to assume that liberty, freedom is the highest value of both the society and of the vast majority of individuals. I don't think it's true. I simply don't think it's true. I was afraid you might say that. Yeah, I don't think it's true. I think people, I don't think, I mean, people value safety and security more than they value freedom and liberty. It's it's played out. We saw it. We literally saw it happen across billions of people. You saw how quickly people traded. And that was one of my points. One of my points in those 20 things is when people are scared, not only will they accept authoritarianism, they will demand it. They'll demand it. They'll demand it. Yep. Right. They want somebody to keep them, tell them what to do. Yes. And stay safe. Yes, and, safe. and it's because I think the desire for safety yeah. and self-preservation overrides, especially when you're scared, especially in fear. Like it, it overrides the general yeah. desire for. Because I guess if you think about it, freedom is uh, freedom and liberty is something you don't notice until it's taken. A bit right? like eyesight. Yeah, just, you don't you don't notice it. Like if you if you have liberty, you yeah. just go about your day. You're not really thinking of freedom and liberty. You're just like, but if something suddenly threatens your safety and well-being or is perceived to do so, you, you know, the, the desire for safety and security is not something that's inherently bad. It's how we you survive. Like it's a normal, it's a normal thing. The danger, as you alluded to, is the potential authoritarianism or totalitarianism that can control, that can control with that. And what happened over the past few years is the danger the way that politicians and media and the way the whole narrative was and due to the nature of the threat was the danger is other people, right? Yes, it's a virus, but it's other people who you need to be afraid of. Your family, your, uh, your, your school, your classmates, your friends, every, every, your, the person walking down the street just by them walking past you or breathing on you or smiling at you could transmit this virus to you. Even if they don't have it, somehow magically, they can transmit viruses they don't even have all of a sudden, right? Like 
And so there was this paranoia, there was this hysteria, and all of the messaging played into that. So I think this is why people were so quick to give it up. Go, this, the second answer I was thinking is that, I was actually just thinking about this last week, so it's a good question. I think that there's a flaw in the way that we learn history. Because you alluded- Anyone? Hmm? Anyone? There are several flaws. <laughs> but I think one that's overlooked is that we, we learn about what happened yeah. and when it happened, yeah. but we don't go deep on the why and the how. We don't go deep on it, right? You, you learn about uh, whatever it is, World War II. You learn about Soviet Russia. You learn about Maoist China. You learn about uh, Germany under Nazi rule. You learn about the Rwandan genocide more recently. You learn about wh whatever it is. You, you, you learn about, okay, this is what happened. Here's when it was. He, these were the people involved. This is what played out. This, you know, that, that's what happened. There's not a lot of psychological analysis of, okay, where were the German people in 1930 that allowed, you have, you have to, firstly, I think you have to recognize that German people today are the same as German people in 1930. Psychologically, biologically, these are the same people. Human nature right? doesn't change. These, right, these, these are the same people. This isn't some for, it's easy to have this lazy view of history and go, oh, well, they were just, they were just stupid and brainwashed or immoral yeah. or whatever. It's I like, wouldn't no. have joined the Hitler Youth. Yes, right. It's like no; these are these are the same people. Fundamentally, the same people, prone, you know, yeah. same virtues and weaknesses and ways of thinking and flaws in thinking and so on. And you have to really insert yourself into it and go, okay, this happens, and then this. How how was this person able to do this? Why why didn't people? You were talking before about people speaking up. Why didn't why didn't people speak up? Why did people do things that they knew were wrong? Why didn't people do this? Why? And hopefully people can answer that now after seeing how certain things have, have played out over these last few years if they didn't get it before. But I think that we're going to keep on repeating that in different ways. And by the way, I want to be clear, I'm not directly comparing the uh, lockdowns and madness of what's happened over the last few years. As much as I've hated it, I'm not directly comparing that to uh, you know Nazi Germany before someone wants to go there and be stupid with it. But psychologically, yeah, you saw the, the same. You saw the same triggers. Yep. You saw the same groupthink. You saw the same, you know, feeling of safety and security overriding mm. freedom and liberty, and, and even decency and the way that people treat one another. People, I mean, look, I haven't forgotten. Last year, people were last year people were happy to throw unvaccinated people into freaking gulags, man. People were happy to segregate, discriminate, lock people in their houses, deny people medical care, so on, stop, kick people out of school, fire people from their jobs. I haven't, for, none of that is forgotten. It all happened. It played out particularly badly in this country. Um, so, well, you, unfortunately, you, you, I was yeah. making this point to our former prime minister the other day, yeah. we've become seen internationally mm -hmm. through the lens of what happened particularly in Melbourne. Yep. Internationally. Correct. People, when I go overseas now, say, what happened to the Australians? Yeah, I'll How be real. Change. I'll be real with you, John. I, I I did not think I'd be in this country right now. I I'll be a hundred percent honest. I wrote off us like in the past in 2020, 2020, I, I was like, man, I am not Australia and Canada. Like, I'm not going to those countries. Like they've shown their true colors. I have no interest in going to Australia. I'm not like, um, and which which is. That gives me no pleasure to say. I mean, after the USA and UK, my next biggest audiences with everything I do are Canada and Australia. And I'm just seeing this all playing out from a distance. I'm seeing the videos. I'm seeing police shooting people with rubber bullets. I'm seeing people being arrested in their own houses. I'm seeing, I was just, I'm seeing all this happening. I'm just like, what on, what on earth is going on out there? And how are people okay with, how are people, how are people cheering it on? And I'm just like, man, that's dark. Like that's there were so differences in the yeah. states in Australia, yes, I'm sure understand. you picked up. Yeah. So you're, you're in Sydney, mm -hmm. where it was, I would say, trepidatiously, tiny relatively bit. sane. Yeah, but none of you could leave the country. <laughs> well, the only countries you couldn't leave were North Korea and Australia. Mm. You, so, don't, you don't want to be. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you don't want to be the only country next to North Korea where you can't leave. I mean, that's or get back in. It's it's one thing if you're out it, of it. Getting yeah, back I in. think there's even quite a big fundamental difference between not allowing people in mm. and not allowing people out. That's actually, 
I, I don't think the former is good either, but there's something particular. I mean, you're a, you're a citizen, a basketball holder. You're the, and they're like, no, you can't, yeah. you can't leave. And and again, even like logically, I mean, it's like well, that doesn't even. The former, you can kind of, it, it still doesn't make sense, but you could under. There, there's some slight more logical rationale for it in that type of situation to say, okay, you, people can't come in, but say people can't go out. Well, we've got some lessons to learn. I, sure, I'm the first sure. to say that. But what I wanted to tease out here mm. is, is something that I've been thinking about, okay. which is that it's not just that we actually quite like being told what to do mm. and we flee for security. What the lesson from lesson, history that we're not learning is there's no such thing as a government which you give all those powers to that is all that willing to give them back to you. And we have no evidence of a government remaining benevolent mm -hmm. once the people allow themselves to be downstream of government mm -hmm. rather than maintaining their position of being upstream of government. Mm -hmm. The democracies are placing themselves at risk, surely, if their citizens are going to say, hey, Mr. Government, we actually want you to keep us safe mm -hmm. because there's no evidence anywhere in history that I can find no. of no. benevolent dictators remaining <laughs> benevolent or such a thing as a benevolent government that's not accountable to its people remaining yes. benevolent. It doesn't happen. Yeah, well, That's I, the problem in the end. 